Mesa Nationals, June 2008. Tucson High seals their victory with this 35-meter distance shot flying out the front door of the University of Maryland gym. Their nearest competitors are almost a factor of two behind them. They have developed a new kind of trebuchet called Merlin for multi-radius linear nodes. It's a variant of a wheel trebuchet with a set of discrete attachment points called sprockets, which are tuned to get every last little bit of energy from a falling counterweight. These trebuchets regularly record efficiencies above 80% in competition and win back-to-back -back national championships 2008 and 2009. Afterwards, Mesa retires the trebuchet competition, but a year later I pick up the design to see how far I can push it. The idea is to shoot golf balls as far as possible with a trebuchet which folds up and fits in the back of a small car. This results in a five-arm Merlin design and a fully triangular frame which throws golf balls over 600 feet, which I figure is a pretty good start. But, for counterweights above 30 pounds, the simulation diverges from reality, and it takes me a while to figure out that frame compliance and cord structure soaking up huge amounts of energy. Note how high this counterweight bounces after release, and mind you, the cord holding the counterweight is no ordinary rope, but 900 pound Kevlar spear fishing line, known for its extremely low stretch. Now I know what you're thinking. Nothing here that a couple of 2x4s and some thick rope won't fix, and you're right. But I bet that I can model this and optimize with structural dynamics because I'm, if I'm right, high performance trebuchets can be built with cheap materials. That kind of simuroid's going to take a while. In the meantime, a new school year starts, and I feel the need to build a bigger machine. The kids build me an 8-foot tall device which hurls softballs 300 feet on its first outing. I figure that's another good start. And later, I get to wind it up to 70 pounds, and I get to 900 feet, and though with some bounce at the end of the throw. At this point, I think I can get to 1,000 feet with a design counterweight of 90 pounds, but the simulation, newly upgraded with rope stretch, says, uh-uh and the 900-foot result never repeats. I now believe that the measurement was a freak because the measured velocity was only 63 meters, and in any case, I'll never know because two weeks later the throwing arm shatters in a high school teacher. Oh so now, I'm back to the drawing board just as I get the new simulation running, and I see a possibility. Moving sprocket one to the back side of the throwing arm forces the rope to stretch earlier, allowing spring energy to rebound before projectile release. This is exactly the kind of tuning I was hoping to find, so I design a new throwing arm and set out to the test range. It takes three people to load it, but we're able to get the full 90 pounds up and fired, and it's kind of impressive. Take a look in slow motion. The counterweight comes pretty much to a dead stop at the bottom. Beautiful, yes? But no. The resulting velocities are above 140 miles an hour, the highest I've achieved yet, but they should be above 160 miles an hour. And although that doesn't sound like a lot, it means that 30% of the energy is still missing somewhere. And that's enough energy to bounce the counterweight up a full half meter at the end of the throw. It simply cannot be. When I plot the simulation on top of the video, they look identical, and I've long since loaded arrow and bearing models into the sim, measured all the masses and inertias, double-checked linear dimensions along with the measurement velocity releases, the sim says 78 meters, but reality says 68, and at this point I have no clue why. So I'm forced to break new ground. I've been assuming so far that ropes act like a spring with very low damping. So what if this isn't true? I can't find any rope damping info on the web, so I run my own experiment, stretching a counterweight between two columns with 30 pound mass in the middle. Setting up a bounce, I can measure the spring coefficients for a variety of ropes deriving a model which matches the empirical data really well. Excellent. Except that when I plug this carefully extracted data back into the sim, it only accounts for about a third of the missing energy, and so now it looks like my detective work is only beginning, and I've still got a hundred joules of vanished energy to find. Now I begin to suspect the stiffness of the counterweight cable, and I'm wondering if that stiffness gets worse under load. The pulleys themselves have ball bearings, but it seems possible that fibers rub against each other as the cord bends around the pulley, adding more drag. So here's the next experiment. 30 pound masses draped over two pulleys. Weight is added to either side until the heavier mass barely coasts downwards and hits the ground. That added weight is drag force. Repeating this in both directions with different weights and cords provides clear results. The, ma the vast majority of drag in a pulley comes not from the bearings, but from the rope bending itself around the pulley. Thin Kevlar fishing line produces almost no rope drag at all, but quarter-inch Kevlar loses almost 15% of the total force transmitted, and the stiffness of the cord doesn't seem to matter. The loose braid of the quarter-inch Kevlar seems like it ought to take less energy to bend, but under load it shows twice the drag of the stiffer 5mm spectrum. 
I test this and with larger pulleys to confirm that the reduced curvature helps and yep, the rope drag comes down by 37% almost exactly what you'd expect from going from a 2.5 to 4 inch pulley. But since I'm already using 4 inch pulleys with the spectra cord, I can only attribute another 4% loss to this effect. So the hunt continues. A day later, I notice that I've left the drag coefficient for the baseball the same weather in flight or during launch, and I recognize that drag during launch is probably a lot higher because of the harness that holds it. For the simulation, this is technically known as a screw-up. I measure the drag by hanging the ball in front of a fan with a known airspeed, and the drag coefficient is 1.53, which is really about seven times higher than the predicted free flight coefficient of 2. I begin to feel now compelled to establish an overall energy budget for the device with a combination of high-speed camera measurements and experimentally verified simulation models. The result is a pie chart with components for drag, kinetic, and potential energy adding up to close to the calculated total of 687 joules. With this knowledge, I go back to the range, this time with a systematic plan for improving performance. Step 1. This is the easy one. Stake the trebuchet to the ground. If you look carefully at earlier shots, it moves slightly backwards with each fire. The result? 2.5% increase energy from a 68.4 meters per second to 69.3. Step 2. Adjust the rigging to get the full 1.85 meter drop in the counterweight. Careful measurement shows me leaving 10% of the counterweight potential on the table. Energy rises 9.8% to 72.6 meters per second. Step 3. Replace the nylon strap pouch with one made from Kevlar rope. This reduces both aero drag and parasitic throwing mass from holding the baseball. Energy rises 7% to a throwing speed of 75.1 meters per second. At 75.1 meters per second, I've got a 69% efficiency with a mass ratio of 283 to 1, pretty much what I'd originally expected. Looking at the high-speed video, you can actually watch the frame bend and release like a bow shooting the arrow. It's taken eight months, but now I can say that dynamic tuning actually works. The question is, what do I do with it? Well, 813 feet is the current distance. Perhaps 1,000 feet is achievable, even yet.